Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. So this week, I'm going to be talking about the deadly cost of incompetence and compromise, um, which is really basically where we are in this country. Um, it was Lance Morrow, the Pulitzer Award-winning journalist, uh, American journalist who wrote in Time magazine in an article, um, I think it was just after the June 12th crisis, that Nigeria then, as now, um, is ever standing on the precipice. And yet somehow, each time, we manage to keep just you know, moving along. In his words, um, Nigeria is a country where the worst never happens and the best is impossible. Um, so clearly, Nigeria is a country born of the, what I consider the lowest form of compromise um, designed to serve the interests of beneficiaries that are not the citizens of Nigeria. And, 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 and that's what we find every day. And so over the years, all our systems are driven from this wheel of compromise and never competence from education, security, agriculture, to even our national politics. It's indeed the politics of mediocrity that drives most of the choices we make as a nation, especially political power, when it comes to political power. It's always not the best woman or man for the job. It's often the, that person who is less threatening, even if less qualified. In fact, more, less qualified. It's what they will often choose, more able to obey. So. You wonder why Nigeria, which has produced some of the best and the brightest in any field of endeavor, still cannot produce enough electricity for its people. I think the answer lies squarely in the politics of compromise and incompetence, which we have elevated to a high art. And for those who remember in Lagos, why should Lagos have badges to generate electricity? And so let's frustrate Lagos or force them to share power to other parts of the country. Why should there be a working free port zone in Calabar? when other regions don't have. So we have a situation where even if we have enough resources to build a world, one world-class hospital in Benin City, for, for example, in the current spot of compromise, the question would then be, what happens to other zones? So let's frustrate Benin and make sure we share the money equally, and eventually nothing gets built anywhere. So instead of building competence, we elevate a sickening quota system of compromises. Today, as countries far less qualified or equipped with resources are finding ways of dealing with this um, corona pandemic, we're busy making excuses for our incompetence, which is now killing Nigerians. Senegal, for example, has shown us how serious a country should deal with, with the pandemic, using skills and resources of its people to build testing kit, treatment centers, and today the country is reporting more people tested, the lowest number of deaths and infections compared to Nigeria, even Ghana has tested over 100,000 people and has announced plans to build 80 new hospitals in towns and villages without one. But in dealing with our national security, we also resort to compromise and indeed elevate regime loyalty. And today we are witnesses to the consequences of the choices we make and hold dear. The fear that I have for our country, Nigeria, is that eventually, it is Nigeria that will kill more people than COVID-19 through compromise and incompetence. And this incompetence rises from the decisions we make daily. That is the real enemy. The real enemy is incompetence and compromises. We should squarely take aim at this and find ways of dealing with this culture of chronism and so that we can get our country moving back to, to, to the path of development and growth. That's it, guys. Thank you. Uh, for me, um, spot on, spot on advocacy and um, um, the way out of, of all of this, because you find that out when you clamor for the youth to take the center stage, um, there are no mentorship. Okay. And, and so the only thing they see out there, you know, the majority of them see 
you know, are the mentors that they see in music, in the entertainment industry. And so no political mentorship. And so when they now, when you clamor for you to take the center stage, they pick out the worst of worst amongst you. Mm. And then, you know, use that as, um, you know, template. A, a template. <laughs> and so all of you now will be pointing at that one as, oh, is that man not a youth? Is he not a youth? So after all, you ask for youth. Yeah, he is, but yet he's not um, competent. Rather, we should be asking, this is not the best of the youth that you could get. So why bring this worst one? Mm. We have better and brighter youths. You know, it's the same thing, you know, in all facets. You, the first thing we ask for, where is he from? What religion does he practice? Rather than, you know, is he competent to do the job? Those are basically, you know, and now our political leaders know these things. So they divide us along that lines. Why is it that when they are together, when they're going, is, um, is good, they don't quarrel. They will be it APC, PDP, EDC, CPC, all of them. Mm -hmm. They don't quarrel. When it is time to share a common patrimony, they are all united. Mm -hmm. How come when you talk about, oh, a section of this country have been so marginalized, yet this section of the country have leaders who are also representing them at the center, and these people are not complaining, but the day they get kicked out of the sharing pots. Mm. That's when they now begin to then complain. They, they say, our people. So they drag us along. So we should, my, for my, my, my advocacy is, we should understand that, you know, all of these people are not with us. So once we see the truth, the only way, if you see incompetence, fighting competence, irrespective of who is involved, mm. not because, oh, your brother is there, whether he's competent or not, is anyway, he's there, mm. let him just remain there. I mean, uh, coming in on that, because I, I know uh, I, I could hear you agreeing with him, is to say, I always try to say, okay, what precedes the attitude? Because the attitude doesn't just materialize by itself. You know, why is it that we have it in abundance in Nigeria? And I feel that to before you start adopting an attitude where you rather subscribe to compromise and incompetence, you must have believed a lie. You know, somewhere along the line, because I even see it on smaller organizations, forget politics, you see where instead of a people building together, they think that their enemy is their, you know, colleague or whoever, and you start pulling in di different directions, you're all going to lose out. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. So somewhere in, in the, our psyche, we've believed a lie. And, we, and this belief of a lie doesn't start with the politicians. It's something that's recycled on a daily basis. It's now a cultural thing. If you go on social media, you see how people trade words based on I don't know, they just they prefer to be angry with the other person based on some sort of vagueness. Oh, you're Igbo, oh, you're Yoruba, you're Hausa. You don't even know what the person really believes. So I, somehow we really believe that lies, like a poison in our souls. And so I agree with you, Emeka, but I would target my enemy at that lie, that lie that somehow divided is the way forward. We need to understand that I, we have more in common I, with I the think, man, I think, your brother, than you have, you know, that separates I you. Think, I, I agree. I, I, can, I, can, can I say something here? Yeah. Um, sorry to, to cut in briefly. Uh, this is a very short advocacy, but I think it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of this advocacy. It's, it's really how, in my view, how the country was set up, ab initio. It was set up based on a foundation of, um, of compromise. I mean, I mean, you know, so it wasn't set up to, to pr produce the best in us. Always, but it we, could, we can take, take we can take responsibility <laughs> henceforth. We can't keep blaming uh, uh, our foundation. I mean, uh, until you, you fix know, you it, and we talked about this on this show several I, times I, I, I uh, I about think, restructuring, America, about America setting allows, the country on the right path. On this. If I, David, come in okay. before we we slot yeah. it. <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> I mean, so personally, I think a a big part of the reason, and a lot of the time when I have conversations on, on these issues, I always I always end up say going toward childhood, and there's a reason for that. The way the things we are raised to believe in Nigeria are kind of a foundational problem okay. that at some point we're going to have to take a look at. We, I mean, I can speak for myself. Okay. The first time in, in my life that I saw that I had words, like I spoke to someone who was a Muslim, I think I was about seven years old. For the first seven years of my life, I don't think I'd ever met a Muslim. You know, and. I had a very, you know, the idea that was fed to me was that they had horns going out of their heads or oh, something, wow. you know. They were not good people. And then I remember I had a classmate, his name was Laulu, and he became a really good friend of mine. And he was a Muslim. You know, and it wasn't like, you know, oh, there's a big deal about him being a Muslim. Then I realized that, oh, he's just like me. It's just that he happens to go to this place called a mosque. So, but that division that was but fed why, to me. Who, I'm assuming your parents fed it. Why did they feed it to you? Because it has to start from somewhere. Again, 
so I don't know if you heard of something called the uh, five five monkeys experiment. Okay. Where basically, I think I have. yeah. So uh, the story behind the experiment is that someone puts five monkeys into a cage. Yeah. Puts a banana. Yes. At, yes. At, on a raised platform. And then. Um, and then any monkeys, stories passed down yeah, from exactly. generation to generation. So basically, all the five monkeys eventually are replaced, and none of the new five monkeys knows why. They are still beating up. Only there's the same story up. of. Um, but they keep on repeating that. So they are guarding a slab mm. for more than thirty yes, years. Yes, I heard they, that one. So, so know, how do we reverse but, but, it? But then? the thing is, because I grew up in a in an environment where you have Muslims and Christians, mm. I can recite the Fatiha. I've recited the Fatiha on this program before, and then I I read some part of the Quran. It wasn't a big deal. Those days, those of us that grew up. You know, where there's Salah celebration, we celebrate together. Where there's Christmas, we celebrate together. We still, you know, the problem is, like Emeka said, a faulty foundation. Okay. When Boko Haram started, people who understood that Boko Haram was not Islamic, rather than them to come out and push the message that this is not an Islamic thing, they all kept silent and maintained a conspiracy of silence because it favored them at that time. Okay. And, and so for those who didn't know, said, well, this is an Islamic thing. And then that election also, rather than us pushing the right narrative, because we want to win election at, at all costs, and there are no rules. Exactly. Even where there are rules, they are observing breach. Exactly. You find out that at the end of the day, these rules are jettisoned completely. And so people now soak in what they hear, you know, during this period. That, that's basically it. Well, I guess the essence of Emeka's message is shine your eye, you. No point walking blindly towards a cliff. Interestingly, my message has a similar moral after the break. I'll tell you more. <laughs> 